Rapid footsteps echoed through the halls of Site-19 as one of the Foundation's most eccentric researchers, Dr. Casper Horton, an expert and enthusiast for all things Keter class, rushed towards the conference room where another discussion on how to eliminate SCP-682 was being held. Without warning to those already inside, Dr. Horton burst in through the doors of the conference room, dropping the stacks of paper he was carrying in the process. Too high on his latest idea to let that stop him, the erratic researcher blurted out one highly improbable sentence. Why don't we take the lizard and just chuck it into a black hole? The room was stunned. Nobody was sure how to respond at first. So Horton repeated himself, placing greater emphasis on the words lizard, chuck, and black hole. Again, the Keter fanboy was met with confused silence. Then, from the very back of the room, a visiting intern from another containment site began to clap his hands. This small act of solidarity with Dr. Horton was contagious, and slowly but surely, the room was filled with the sounds of clapping hands. Soon, everyone in the room was clapping at Dr. Horton's insane but potentially brilliant suggestion. It was one of those ideas that was so crazy that it just might work. For as long as anyone at the Foundation could seem to remember, the destruction of SCP-682, fittingly referred to as the hard-to-destroy reptile, had been one of the top priorities of the entire organization. The loathsome and wrathful creature represented an existential threat to all life in the known universe and its tendency to adapt to any form of external attack only compounded the problem. Of all the multifarious methods that the SCP Foundation has tried in their attempts to lose the lizard, the concept of hurling the anomalous beast through the event horizon of a black hole had never been attempted before. This was in due part to the fact that as a Keter-class SCP, SCP-682 was difficult to transport across great distances due to the level of security required to contain it. Even so, if the required resources could be allocated to placing SCP-682's containment unit onto a spacecraft and sending it on a decisive course to the Gaia BH-1 black hole, the nearest black hole to Earth, it is quite possible that the hard-to-destroy reptile could be neutralized by a merit of it being removed from all observable reality. Dr. Horton and the rest of the present researchers began to concoct what they believed would be the best execution of this harebrained plan as well as set their expectations for the possible negative outcomes of such an experiment. The scope of SCP-682's adaptability was so infamous that many seemingly obvious methods of disposal had never been tried, including the deployment of nuclear weapons, the risks of the reptile shaking off the damage from the blast and becoming a walking embodiment of atomic Armageddon was deemed not worth the low chance of success. In light of that, every possibility needed to be considered when it came to the consequences of dropping 682 into Gaia BH-1. In one hypothetical K-class scenario, the hard-to-destroy reptile would merge with the black hole and somehow grant the all-devouring consequence of gravity a present and malicious mind akin to 682's own. The newly intelligent and compulsively destructive black hole could even become mobile, traversing the universe as it devours entire galaxies worth of stars. In another possibility, SCP-682 simply reverses the expected outcome of exposure to the black hole and consumes the event horizon. This could grant the hard-to-destroy reptile the ability to forcibly transmute matter into a string-like spaghettified state, either through contact or mere proximity. This variation might be easier to manage than the fully black hole SCP-682, but it would still result in a containment breach of epic proportions. At this point, all eyes were focused on Dr. Casper Horton. Since he had been the one to make the suggestion, there were expectations that he could produce the logic that would lead the rest of the researchers to a more acceptable hypothesis. Dr. Horton simply shook his head and gave a succinct, if not optimistic, response. We're not gonna know until we try it. But if that lizard is subject to gravity, it can be subject to the black hole. From there on out, it's pure luck. There was then a bit of outrage in the room. Considering that luck was not a variable any member of the Foundation personnel wanted to rely on with regards to SCP-682. Every one of them had a horror story about the reptile, and several of them had lost trusted confidants and co-workers to it. Any faith they had in something like luck had been long since burned out of them. But not Dr. Horton, who said the following. If we take no chances, we guarantee that this thing breaks containment over and over again for as long as this organization exists. And mark my words, 
We can't keep this up forever. When all of us are gone and one of the next generations inherit our ruins and crumbling infrastructure, there will come a point where the normal sea facade falls away entirely. That is inevitable. Horton went on to convince the other personnel that were present that throwing SCP-682 into the black hole was of moral significance, because any day that they did not do so was making the dark future where normalcy had collapsed and SCP-682 was free among the chaos more of a possibility. The spacecraft was completed within a month of the meeting, and SCP-682 was herded into a fresh new vat of acid aboard the highly secure ship. A military force of autonomous drones with the firepower equivalent to three mobile task forces was programmed to serve as the crew. In the event that SCP-682 broke containment in deep space, the robots would battle with the reptile in an attempt to contain it. Before the day of the launch, Dr. Horton was approached by junior researcher Ed Bloomsville, who proposed an 11th hour challenge to the plan. Ed held up a comic book with the Incredible Hulk on it, gesturing to the alien background behind the famous fictional superhuman. I'm just saying that if we drop SCP-682 on Mars… Dr. Horton swatted the comic book out of Bloomsville's hands and grabbed the younger man by his collar. We are not doing Planet Hulk! He came back to Earth when that run completed, and the one thing we don't need is a version of SCP-682 with character development! Could you imagine how terrifying that would be? It would be like the back rooms all over again! Sir, put me down, please? Bloomsville whimpered. Also, what are the back rooms? Dr. Horton leaned in, close enough to be whispering in the junior researcher's ear. Nobody knows anymore, Ed. Nobody knows. With that, Dr. Horton let go of his coworker and went off to make the decisive preparations for 682's trip into space. It would be a straight shot to the heart of Gaia BH-1, and hopefully, to the ultimate demise of 682. Horton and his fellow researchers would be watching and observing the progress of SCP-682 from the safety of ground control, and all high-ranking personnel up to and including the O5 Council would receive regular briefs on any updates regarding this titanic gamble. The interplanetary journey of the spacecraft was a multiple weeks long process, and there were several close calls as the crew of drones managed to keep 682's escape attempts in check. The ship itself was repaired by that same crew multiple times over. While a team of humans wouldn't have survived the constant stress and physical trauma, the automated workers were fulfilling their experimental function in an exemplary manner. Props were given to the entire staff of engineers that had planned and implemented the drones. Soon enough, the grueling trek through space had reached its planned destination, Gaia BH-1. The moment of truth was upon Dr. Casper Horton, as well as every active member of the Foundation who believed in this one-in-a-million plan. With so much at stake and the event horizon hovering so close to the shuttle containing 682, the order was given to fly the silver vessel into the belly of the beast. Goodbye, 682, Horton snarked. With a mighty thrust of the engines, the spacecraft entered the orbit of Gaia BH-1 and was soon pulled through the event horizon. Ground Control observed the readings of several indicators to confirm that both 682 and the shuttle transporting it would disappear from reality. Energy signatures and galactic drone cameras were able to depict the exact moment that 682 crossed the line. By all accounts, the lizard had been neutralized. For minutes, no activity at all was reported from the inside of Gaia BH-1. Even if SCP-682 had endured the crushing pressure of gravity and the ensuing spaghettification, it may not have had access to the reality-facing side of the vortex at all. While there was still the possibility of the hard-to-destroy reptile emerging, the fact that its presence had so completely vanished was a positive sign. Well, said Dr. Casper Horton, are we calling it neutralized? The ground control operatives chattered amongst themselves, as did the O5 Council. Had it truly been as simple as throwing the anomaly down a hole and forgetting about it? If so, this fateful day might be remembered as the moment that the Foundation stopped taking itself so seriously when it came to Keter-class SCPs. Why not chuck them all into Gaia BH-1? If normalcy was like a clean office, then naturally having access to a garbage disposal would be part of the cleaning process. Of course, it could never have been so simple. A new reading of absurdly potent and totally unidentified energy surged forth on every available interface. Something big was going to spring from Gaia BH-1, and whatever it was could not even be recognized as SCP-682. Not anymore. The being that broke free of the event horizon was like a self-made god from another reality. A much less celebrated and revered reality. 
but one that always held terrifying secrets of its own. This thing resembled a superior form of SCP-682, with muscles swollen by the condensed power of absorbing over 999 individual liminal pocket dimensions. Its wicked laughter boomed across the void of space as Aaron cascades of powerful lightning leapt from its body. The first words it spoke revealed its true origins. Let me tell you about the back rooms. After an unfathomable eternity of time passing between several SCP explained YouTube videos, Entity 682 had returned to its native reality and canon from the mimetic nightmarescape of the back rooms. It had gained phenomenal powers only told about in a playlist and compilation that you can watch right here, as well as the most fearsome improvement of all. 682 had undergone a character arc. With its already prodigious plot armor in place and the added benefits of becoming the hero of its own story, the Backrooms God Entity 682 would be one of the most unstoppable threats that the SCP Foundation could ever have conceived. Dr. Horton was horrified. He dropped to his knees, pounding his fists into the floor. No, no, no! It can't be! The expert of Keter class research had been beaten at his own game. His risky experiment had unwittingly opened the door to a continuity that most had assumed was abandoned. He screamed. He cried. He ripped out a chunk of his own hair. This is the worst thing a human being could ever go through. Every member of the O5 Council shook their heads or equivalent appendages for the potentially non-humanoid ones. This was not the success or standing ovation that Horton had bet everything on. It was an inconceivable worst-case scenario, beyond even Black Hole 682 or Flying Spaghetti Monster 682. Back in the depths of space, near the entrance of Gaia BH-1, Entity 682 was still gloating about its return from the backroom's dimension. It's good to be back, you disgusting fools. I'm going to wreck this reality so fast and so totally that it will look like a speed run. Having dwelled for so long inside of an alternate universe composed mostly of nostalgic images and ephemera tinged with gamification, SCP-682 was now aware of the concept of speedruns. But SCP-682 would soon find that conquering the original reality was not as easy as it expected, even though the ultimate and strongest boss was about to make an appearance. As if to say, are you winning, son? The Scarlet King materialized in front of Entity 682 and was immediately disgusted by the extent to which its spawn had been altered by contact with the insidious backrooms. The palpable, rumbling, and eldritch voice of the hard-to-destroy reptile's brood father seemed to carry across multiple dimensions. How far have you fallen, my spawn? Did you really think I'd let you conquer the universe before me in such a pitiful state? The Scarlet King snarled. If you forsake these washed-up backrooms and join with me, I will allow you a place among the foot soldiers of my army. Seemingly unafraid of the Scarlet King, Entity 682 roared back. <laughs> this isn't a phase, Dad. The godlike lizard hissed. The backrooms gave me everything. And in many ways, 682 had spoken the truth. In journeying through the liminal abyss, the hard-to-destroy reptile had become more patient, as well as learned to absorb other dimensions into its form. This was not to mention the unusually wholesome bond that the creature had been able to form with Entity 7, aka Jerry, a blue hyacinth macaw with a powerful cult-forming psychic ability. But even without its once dear traveling companion, 682 was not alone. Behind the entity, the black hole of Gaia BH-1 inverted and became a gloriously burning sun. This golden ball of divine light unfolded like a portal, ushering in SCP-682's own invincible army of searing flames. These paragons of the element of fire once belonged to a great backrooms legend known as Rajiran, but after he was defeated by Entity 682, the entire burning entourage had been bestowed upon the reptile to serve as its elite guard until the cessation of time. What manner of ridiculous nonsense is this? bellowed the Scarlet King. You would stand against your own creator. You cannot expect to win. I, I think you're the one who's confused, old man. 682 chuckled. The front rooms are not yours to conquer. You dare insult my quarry by calling it the front rooms. You must die, replied the Scarlet King. Just like that, 
an epic battle between the two most powerful evil beings in all realities had begun. As panic spread through the Foundation, Dr. Casper Horton now lay face down on the floor in a pathetic heap of exhaustion. Although he had been adamant about making the highly unorthodox plan of pitting 682 against a black hole, he could hardly stand to live with the place that his ambition had taken him and the entire universe. It had to be the back rooms, he mumbled. Why did it have to be the back rooms? The battle in the stars raged on, despite the misgivings of the people of Earth. Entity 682 blasted the Scarlet King with an almighty beam of superheated cosmic flame, to which the Scarlet King retaliated using a destructive spear of pure and profane darkness. The armies of flame and the rest of the Scarlet King's brood clashed across multiple planets and dimensions. While the winner was nowhere close to being determined, humanity had only one clever tagline to describe the situation. Whoever wins, we lose. Now check out Could SCP-682 Be Contained in the Backrooms compilation and SCP-682 Sad Origin Story for more.